everyone in the town was on the same page. They were ready for this moment. In fact, back in, in the ancient Middle East, every town would be prepared. If there was someone of importance who was going to be coming into town, they were ready. They, they would have lodging put together. They would have food put together. They had everything prepared because they wanted to make sure that their town looked great to whoever this was that was coming into town. And in this case, it was someone that they've been hearing whispers about for a long time. A and this city of Jericho was just prepared to live up to its historic name of all the ways that God had brought victory to them. They wanted to present that to this teacher who was going to be coming through their town. And so just like how n most towns would have worked back then, when an important person was coming in, rather than waiting for that person to get all the way into town before greeting them, they went all the way outside the town, sometimes as much as 10 miles or further, to meet this traveling important person and walk them into the town to present the best of who they were. And so this town got together, a great crowd went out to meet this teacher on the road as he made his way in. And you have to imagine, they put the best of the best closest to him, right? You want to give a good impression. And so as, as this teacher was making its way towards the front, of the, uh, the, the front of the town, they could hear something that just made their hearts sink. They could hear Bart. And blind Bartimaeus was this guy who had a notorious reputation of being very good at his job. And his job was quite simple. He begged. That was his part of their society. He would beg for money. He couldn't see Right. And so he just sat outside of the gates and he would call out for people to give him money. And back then it was just a very simple exchange. People gave him money. He would, uh, ex you know, exhort that person, say how beautiful and wonderful of a person they were. And then they moved on their business. That's just how it worked. And they did not want the first impression of their town to be some guy asking the teacher for money. And yet there he was. They tried to get him to shut up and it didn't work. In fact, that, that's the way that Luke describes it there in Luke 18 is that they were telling him to shut your mouth and he did not listen. He kept calling out over and over and I just can't imagine how embarrassed all of these people would be. Oh my goodness, this guy just doesn't know his place. He doesn't know who this person is. And yet the teacher calls out and says, bring him to me. And like eyes of grace and mercy, they, they finally say, okay, all right, stand up, Bart. We're going to do this. Get, get over here. And, and even more, their hearts would have sunk because they knew what he was going to ask, right? The way that society worked, he wouldn't want to be healed, which is what this guy was known for, because he wouldn't have anything else to do. His only means of income, the only thing he was trained for was to beg. There's no way he would ask to be healed. He just wanted to get money. And with how important and, and, and well thought of this guy was and successful he seemed to be, he probably had deep pockets perhaps. No one knew, but they didn't want this to be the first impression of Jericho. And yet, much to their surprise, Jesus asked him a question. What do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus said, I want to see. That had to have sent ripples through everyone. No one would have guessed that that's what he would have wanted. I mean, that takes faith for him to be healed. He would now have to learn how to support himself by other means other than begging. And yet, instantly, he started to see. And not only did Bartimaeus start to cry out and praise God, but everyone in the crowd were so excited. They got to witness Jesus perform a miracle, and everyone in the town's yelling and praising God, and they start making their way through town, and, and that's when they realize Jesus is not going to stop. I mean, it, 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 I guess they, he never said he was going to, but you got to get prepared for that type of stuff. But sure enough, he's just passing through because he's on his way to Jerusalem. And this is near the end of his ministry. No one knew what was going to happen in there, but he was dead set on getting to Jerusalem. And so he makes his way through the town. And in the midst of this town, there was one other person who wasn't in the crowd for two fairly obvious reasons. One, because he was too short. He couldn't see over the crowd anyway. And it's, it's really hard to navigate through a thick crowd if you can't see over anything else, but also because uh, it would be very unsafe for him to enter a crowd. You see, this guy was notorious. He was well-known, but not well-liked. In fact, just straight-up hated 
And for him to enter a crowd, all it would take is one quick thinking person to pull out a knife and just end him. And then they would have some peace for even just a little while. See, this guy was not just a tax collector who would steal from his own people, but he was a chief tax collector. He was in charge of other people who would steal from the people as well. Needless to say, they did not have high opinions of this guy. And so there was no way in the world he was going to try and enter this crowd. And yet he desperately wanted to see Jesus. And so he did two things that people in that day and age would never do, let alone a rich man would never have done this. First off, he ran ahead. And and men just back then didn't run, let alone a wealthy man. He just didn't run. And yet uh, Luke tells us that that he has started to run on ahead. And the second thing he did that we all know and affiliate with Zacchaeus, he climbed the tree, right? Climbed the sycamore tree for the Lord he want to see. Anyone? No? Okay, because I've sung Sunday school songs before and no one has any idea what I'm saying. So <laughs> I'm glad to know there's some non-heathens here. Um, so anyway, Zacchaeus runs ahead, right, breaking that. And then he, run, he climbs up a tree, which you would never be caught dead. Children climb trees, not rich men. And here's the thing that I find baffling. It's something I learned this last week, and that is, why do you think Luke tells us that it was a sycamore tree? You ever wondered that? I mean, why not just say he climbed up a tree? He specifies it's a sycamore tree, and I I found out it's because sycamore trees don't grow inside of towns. They had rules kind of set up that if you're going to plant a sycamore tree, it would be outside the town by 75 or 100 feet or so, at least that distance from the gate of where the town would actually begin. So you have to realize what Luke is telling us is that he didn't want anyone to notice him. He ran to the other side of town to get ahead of the crowd and climb up in this tree, which was notorious for low-hanging branches, perfect for a short guy, but also for thick uh, you know, b- branches that would be hard to see through. He didn't want anyone to know that he was there. And I kind of wonder, why did Zacchaeus want to see Jesus so much? I mean, maybe like how some of us, you would want to just see his face that you'd heard so much about. about. Uh, maybe he wanted to see Jesus perform a miracle like so many other people who had heard of Jesus, just see him. Maybe he wanted to hear from Jesus teach as he walked along the road. We don't know. We just know that he was so desperate to see Jesus. He broke two unthinkable rules of their culture and then waited in uh, trying to hide himself from everyone else. And maybe he thought that by the time Jesus got to the other side of of the town, the crowd will have diminished by then, but that didn't end up being the case. Because as he was up there in that tree, you know, Jesus called out to him, which had to terrify him. And I'm just, I'm curious how he didn't just straight up fall out of the tree, but he didn't. And Jesus called out to him, Zacchaeus, I want you to come down from there because I'm going to eat at your house today. Now, oftentimes when we read about Zacchaeus and we hear this story, we get kind of warm, fuzzy feelings like, oh, that's so cool that Jesus would show kindness to Zacchaeus and he goes and he eats with with Zacchaeus, but I want us to try and picture this for a moment from the perspective of this town that had already set up everything for him. Any, a, any good Middle Eastern town of Jesus' day would have made sure lodging was available and food was available, and yet Jesus told them, I'm just passing through. And here, Jesus says, oh wait, Zacchaeus, let's go back into town. I'm going to eat at your house. How do you think the crowds felt. See, this is what blows me away. If you're, if you look in Luke 19 with the story of Zacchaeus, most times when we hear people muttering against Jesus, it's the Pharisees. And almost universally, when we see people mutter or complain against Jesus, it's the Pharisees or the Sadducees or Herodians or anyone like that. And yet here it says it was the crowd. This exact same crowd that just a few verses before, was praising God along with everyone else, is now muttering against Jesus because they said he's going to go eat with a sinner? And man, is it easy for us to sit in our pews and be like, wow, what awful judgmental people they were. But think about this. They had a room for Jesus already. 
They had food prepared. I mean, if you were told Jesus Christ is going to come and, and we're going to make sure he gets set up at your house, I want you to make it the best it's ever looked. I want you to make the best food you've ever made. My guess is you would have gone out and bought, like, the most expensive cut of beef or meat or, I mean, not pork, obviously, but meat that you've ever bought before in your life. You probably were already working on the food, and then you find out he's not even coming over and he's just passing through. Oh, wait, he's going to go to the tax collector's house? See, we're going to come to a verse here in Matthew 7 that we're all very familiar with because most likely it's been quoted at you before. It's this verse that if you've spent any time on Facebook at all or any sort of social media, you've seen this quoted, and oftentimes by people who aren't even Christian. They may not even know where it comes from. But if you share any sort of an opinion whatsoever online or if you say something out loud, my guess is Matthew 7, 1 has been quoted to you before, and it just simply says, do not judge lest you be judged. Don't judge, right? We throw that around a lot. We do something embarrassing. We just tell people, don't judge me, right? We quote Matthew 7 when it helps us out. And, and, and most times when I've seen this quoted, it's like I said, at people, almost in an attacking way. How dare you judge people? You're not supposed to judge people. Christians are not supposed to judge people. And, and what we need to ask ourselves is, how does that work? How does that function? And I realize that the story of Zacchaeus presents us with the perfect tension we need to feel if we're going to approach Matthew 7, 1. Because I want you to imagine what it would be like to be that person in the town who had prepared your place for Jesus, only for him to go out and show mercy to some oppressive, evil person. See, most times when we talk about Zacchaeus and we talk about tax collectors of their time, we call them traitors. We, we call them you know, people who were, were greedy and they just wanted money and stuff like that. But it, it was so deep inside of them that even speaking to a tax collector, being around a tax collector just made you filthy in their eyes. They hated them. There's no way of understating that. They hated them. There's a reason Zacchaeus did not try to push his way through the crowds. They hated him. And yet Jesus picks him out of everyone in that crowd, to go and eat with. See, we understand when God shows mercy to the oppressed. We get it. We love hearing stories of how Jesus goes through and he reaches out to the poor. He reaches out to the broken, the hurting. We preach that a lot about how God will reach into your broken mess of a life and pull you out. But what happens when God shows mercy to the oppressor? to the person who has worked actively to make your community worse and more fearful. And in fact, a great word to describe Zacchaeus would be collaborator. Do you realize most of the people of that day were waiting for Messiah to come through and absolutely destroy Rome? And here these people were working for Rome. They collaborated with the enemy actively. We understand when Jesus helps out the poor, but we struggle with the tension when he helps out the oppressed. We need to understand that tension. You need to feel that tension for us to really grasp what Jesus is teaching here in Matthew 7. A and here's probably a surprise to some of you who maybe have used this in an attacking fashion before. But Matthew 7, 1 is not a verse in isolation. It's not a verse devoid of all context. In fact, there's a lot of context in these six verses in Matthew 7 that help us understand what Jesus is saying here. Because I'm going to propose to you, Jesus is not suggesting you are not to cast any judgments whatsoever on anyone ever at all. Because let's be real, that is absolutely impossible. If someone starts walking towards you with a maniacal look on their face and they're holding a knife, my guess is you're not going to be the, like, oh, I shouldn't cast judgment on him. Maybe he's just happy and he wants to go home and eat steak or something. We would never do that, right? We, we cast judgment, but at the same time, we also need to understand why we are allowed to make judgments about people and in what context and perspective we're supposed to have. That word perspective is going to be key because the whole of the Sermon on the Mount, where we find these words, Jesus is giving his people 
perspective. In fact, the Beatitudes we oftentimes think of as things that we're supposed to fulfill. And really, it's just giving hope to people who are lost, who are meek, who are broken, and just reminding them to have greater perspective than what we can see in our own life. In fact, just before this, Jesus uses that phrase you've probably heard before, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, right? That's perspective. Don't work so hard here on earth that you're throwing your eternity away. Have a right perspective. And Matthew 7, 1 through 6 also reinforces this. We need to have perspective. And this is what Jesus says about judgment, the whole context of it. Jesus says, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all at the same time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Don't give to dogs what is sacred. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Now, like I said, Jesus is not obviously telling us you are not allowed to make any judgments about people whatsoever because if we were to try and live in a way where we make zero judgments about people, we will come across super disingenuous, right? You've known people, you've probably had moments in your life where you're talking with someone and they're trying to be nice and pretend not to see the thing that's like obviously wrong with you. Like, you know, I haven't been able to shower today. Oh, you look fine. Right. We pick up on that right away. We know when someone is not being honest with us, that drives us nuts. Jesus is not telling us to go through life being disingenuous with people, but he is telling us to have the right perspective. And there's two reasons why we can know Jesus isn't saying you can't make any judgments whatsoever in any context on anyone. And the first thing is because of what he says about the plank and the sawdust. Most times, if you've read enough of scripture and you throw out the do not judge or you will be judged, you've probably said, look, you got a plank in your eye. And the first thing we need to understand is that a lot of us have a plank in our eye. Right. And let me ask you this. If I have this right here, how much use am I to any of you? How many of you would try? I I don't know why I should ask you questions where you have to raise your hands, but whatever. You can see yourselves. How many of you would trust me to drive you to the grocery store? I legitimately have no idea if anyone's raising their hand. How many of you would trust me to perform surgery on you? Then again, even without the plank that don't have that much trust. But let's say I was a doctor, right? If you had a doctor come into your room like this, okay, let's go cut you open, you would run. You would just run, right? It, no matter what, there is absolutely nothing I can do for you if I'm having this lodged thing in my eye. And keep in mind, this is kind of violent imagery because Jesus is not just describing like a plank that's floating in front of your face. He's saying like someone shoved this piece of wood into your face, And so many of us have this log, and we're like, hold on, I need to help you with a little speck. Stop moving, right? What Jesus is telling us is you need to remove this if you want to help someone, and that's the thing. That's why we know that we can, in fact, use our discerning judgment with people. But the thing is, it's not to berate them. It's not to tear them down. In fact, Jesus says here, a lot of times we just stop at the, you hypocrite, take the log out of your eye, and we ignore what Jesus says next. He tells us why. Why should you take the log out of your own eye? So you can help your brother with the speck of sawdust in theirs. Jesus is not saying here to just ignore all the specks of sawdust that are in our eyes. In fact, remember James James says, confess your sins to one another. Part of being in a Christian community is being able to admit to one another when we have these sawdust specks in our eyes, and sometimes we don't even realize it. Part of that loving unconditionally is the fact that we can't help one another with those specks. But we got to take this thing out of our eyes first. And I don't, I, I'm, I'm no like great philosopher or anything like that, but something tells me if you're going to help someone with the speck of sawdust in their eye, then you are using judgment. And you have to discern it. 
In fact, that's what I think verse 6 is all about. Verse 6 is maybe when you're reading it, you're like, well, this seems kind of out of place. And don't worry, most people believe that. Even scholars that I've read commentaries on, when they're discussing verse 6, they go in many different directions. But I think in context, it makes sense. What Jesus is saying is use discernment. Let's say you have, in fact, managed to get this out of your eye and you want to help someone with a speck of sawdust in theirs. Jesus is not suggesting you throw them on the ground and you start digging at their eye to try and get it out and force it upon them. Sometimes people are not ready for your help. And I think what Jesus is saying here is don't force it on someone who's not ready to receive it because it could end poorly. If you start throwing pearls to swine, they could attack you because once they realize it's not food, they're going to get angry. In the same way, when you try to help someone who's not ready to receive that type of help, it could end very poorly. I think that's what verse 6 is telling us, is to use discernment. In a grander scheme, we can even use this in context of sharing our faith. Use discernment when you're trying to talk to someone about Jesus. Some people you meet, they're going to be ready for you to open up your Bible, point to a verse, and start reading and walking through it with them. But other people, they're going to view that as an attack. And they're not going to treat this pearl, this sacred thing, well. And they're going to try and destroy it right in front of you. So we need to use discernment. And I think that's all Jesus is saying in verse 6. I don't think he's trying to be derogatory about other people. He's giving us a picture of what people do when we try to help, uh, try to help them or present them with something sacred that they're just not ready for. They don't know how to handle it. So we have to use discernment, we have to, it, which takes patience. By the way, remember Peter that we quoted a while ago, right? When people ask you the reason for the hope that you have, share it with them in gentleness and respect. That takes patience. I think Jesus is reinforcing that same type of idea here. So now that we understand that, we probably have two questions, and we need to understand both questions because the answer kind of flows between both. And the first question you're probably wondering is that it's really easy to say I need to take this plank out of my eye, but I don't know how. How do I remove How do I know that this plank is out of my eye? Some people might be wondering that, like, I don't think I have a plank in my eye. I don't think I've been like one of those people, but how do I know? How do I get this out of my eye? And the second question is, then why does Jesus say don't judge? If we're allowed to use discernment among one another, then what is this saying? If, it, if I am, in fact, allowed to it, make certain judgments for people in order to help them, in order to benefit them and, and grow them and work with them and not to belittle or tear them down, then, then why does Jesus start off by saying, don't judge? And I think another way we can understand Jesus' use of judgment here is to understand it in the scheme of eternity, perspective, in other words. What Jesus is saying in Matthew 7, 1 and 2 is don't put yourself on the judgment throne of God. Don't go through this life pretending like you can set out who's going to heaven and who's going to hell by your perfect judgment because the truth is you don't want to be judged by your own judgment. You don't know everything. You don't have all the facts. You don't know what's going on in a person's life. You don't know what's going on in their head. You don't know what it was like for them growing up or what it's like for them right now. You cannot sit in the judgment throne of God and pretend like you know better. That's why Jesus says in verse 2, which is always important, if you're going to quote Matthew 7, 1, quote verse 2 with it because it gives us this perspective. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. Let me ask you this. The judgment calls you've made on people, would you really want to have that same judgment applied to you? I think all of us have this idea that we're pretty good at sizing up people or we might have a good idea. I'll, I'll just admit, I'm not. I, I've always been terrible. Trusted people I probably shouldn't have trusted. Not trusted people I probably should have trusted. I'm terrible judge of character. I certainly do not want to go before the throne of God and have him say, guess what, Mark? going to judge you in the same way you were judging other people. Because here's the thing. None of you want to be judged in the way that you judge other people. I don't care how loving and kind you are in your judgment. You do not want your eternity determined by your judgment. And here's why. Because when we go and stand before the throne of God, there's only one way that you will be declared clean. And it's only possible in his courtroom.
One day we're going to stand before God and his judgment is going to see all of our sin. He's going to know every single thing you've ever done. And it's going to be laid out there. But in his goodness and kindness, he will declare you perfect by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that is something that cannot be done in any of our courtrooms. No matter how good or perfect you think you are. You do not want to go before God and have him use your judgment against yourself. Which leads into how do I get this out of my violently torn apart eyeball? How do I experience healing? How do I even know if this is here? And I think a good question is to look back at the story of Zacchaeus. There's a reason that I brought him up first, and it's because so many of us read the story of Zacchaeus completely removed from their context, and we think how great it was, how awful those judgmental people were, and we don't even see ourselves. I mean, think about how angry they would have been that Jesus would take his time to go to Zacchaeus' house. They wanted to represent themselves as the humble, righteous people that they were. They wanted to give him the best show, the best stuff that they could offer as a community and present themselves in that way. And he's going to go blow it all on Zacchaeus. All the work you poured into getting things ready for him, he's going to Zacchaeus' house. If you look in Luke 19, you can see that there frustration was in one very simple thing. He's going to go eat with a sinner. And none of them saw it. None of them said to themselves, you know what? So am I. See, here's the thing about judgment is that we are so good at seeing the worst in other people. We're so good at noticing where we can draw lines in the sand of where God's grace can extend and where it stops. And one of my, my best friends who was here years ago named David Peterson, who's in uh, uh, the Navy as a chaplain, used to say that we like to draw God's grace starting like right behind us. Why? Because we know our sin and we know how to justify it. Yeah, I lose my temper every now and then, but, you know, it's not a big deal. Yeah, I, I, I struggle with some things every now and then, but that I understand. Those people, oh, don't even get me started on them. See, the thing is, the people of Zacchaeus' day did not want to see who they were in light of eternity. They wanted to see themselves as the way they had built up. They didn't want to see themselves in the way that Zacchaeus eventually saw himself. See, when Zacchaeus realized the love that Jesus was showing him, it had a profound effect on him. And we actually get a glimpse into something we don't often get a glimpse of in Jesus' time on earth. Most times when he would tell a parable like the prodigal son, one of the most well-known parables of Jesus, we don't find out what happens the next day with the prodigal son. We don't find out what happens to him for the rest of his life. The last bit of scene that we have with him is him being enveloped in undeserved love and then it just ends. Zacchaeus is a different story. Zacchaeus, we find out he's eating with Jesus. We don't know if there's been a conversation or if it's just been just awkward silence, which it may very well have been. I mean, he's in the presence of someone he clearly admires, and most of us were in the presence of someone who we clearly admire. We, we get kind of frozen. We don't know what to say, and it's just kind of weird. And, and yet, in this profound show of love, Zacchaeus calls out and he says, I'm going to give it all away. And he changed. He gives half of, he says, I'm going to give half of all I have to the poor and anyone that I've ever stolen from, I will repay them four times the amount. And Jesus says, salvation has truly come to this house. Why? Because the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost which sometimes includes those people, the people we cannot comprehend, the people we don't understand, the people who have hurt us or hurt people we love. We don't understand when God's grace starts coming for them. 
And it's so easy for us to, without even realizing, I don't know anyone that purposely does this, we draw the line in the sand. And really what we are living with is this. We have this firmly in front of our eyes, just jabbed it in there, and we have no recollection of it. We don't want to pay attention to it. What Jesus calls us to have is perspective. And if you want to get this out of your eyes, you need to have a right perspective on yourself. You need to learn from the mistake of Jericho and recognize that you can't call people sinners in that cold of a term without realizing you're in the same boat. Even if you've come to Jesus and you've given your life to him, you realize you didn't earn that. One of the things that I've done recently that really has had an, an impact on me, and it sounds so simple. I'm not even suggesting any of you do this. I'm just letting you know one of the things that I've done recently that had an effect on me. Um, and it, it's not even new. I didn't create this. I didn't come up with this. Uh, but I just started in my prayers referring to God as my father. Wow, bombshell. But I'm telling you, I started doing that, and it hit me that I get to call God my father. I didn't earn my place at the table. I haven't been perfect enough where I finally can say I'm a child of God, I'm a son of God, and say so with pride. But instead, every single time that I pray and I say, Father, it overwhelms me that he chose that. I remember one time when Ella, who, when she gets older, is going to kill me for telling this story, but the day we found out that she uh, was lactose intolerant, she was for like two years, um, was not a happy day. We had made fruit salad and added in some yogurt, you know, toss it all together. We didn't even add sugar, just yogurt and fruit. And it was delicious, by the way. But that night we set her in her crib and uh, I'll spare you the details. Needless to say, we saw dinner again. Uh, and it was just like all over her. It, it was all over her bed. And if you've ever seen a crib, you realize there's a lot of crevices. There's a lot of places. And if you've ever seen a child's room, you understand it's not always perfectly clean. There was things there that it got on. And I remember walking in the room and just seeing it working its way out just all over everything, all over her, all over the bed. And I'm telling you, I walked in there, I said, good luck to you. I went and I went into the hallway, I grabbed a, a, a just a cloth, a towel, and I threw it at her. I said, good luck picking it up. She's like two, she can handle this. I just said, you, you can figure this out. You got this together, you can make that work. Come on, clean yourself up. This is ridiculous. I'm not touching any of this. This is disgusting. I almost didn't tell that joke because we actually got reported to the uh, county earlier this week. But needless to say, before any of you start calling our foster care services, well, I didn't actually do that, right? Because even an imperfect, awful, sometimes father like me can still come through every now and then and recognize that when my child is in need, I need to do the dirty work. And I went in there, and I got her cleaned up. I picked up all the huge chunks of grape and all that. I cleaned up her bed. I got it desanitized, flipped over her mattress, gave her a new sheet, put her in clean clothes. She got cleaned up and laid her back down because even someone like me knows how to care for their child. See, and here's the thing. We lose that perspective on God. We forget how he has done that to us. And what we end up doing is we're sitting there covered in our own filth and we start making fun of other people and judging them for the filth that it's all over them. Yeah, they did it to themselves, but you have completely ignored what you've done to yourself. You need to take the log out of your own eye because the truth is we need to help each other. And you can't do that if you're arrogant. You can't do that before recognizing that God has shown you grace that you didn't earn. He has called you son and daughter, even though you didn't earn it. So if you're sitting here this morning or joining online and you're thinking to yourself that I, I've, I've done that, 
I know who I am in the eyes of God, and I've taken this log out of my eye. I'm challenging you. Help other people. Help them to see it. In humility, go before people that you know need to know how to take this out of their eye and teach them. Because every lesson you learn is not given to you by God for your own benefit. Even the whole story about Zacchaeus, a lot of those details, I learned this last week in a book. I'm not that smart. I don't know Middle Eastern culture that well. I learned it from other people, and now I want you to know some of what I'm learning. That's how this is supposed to function as a Christian culture, is we help one another. So if you've managed to figure this out, help people. But maybe you haven't. And maybe you still feel like you don't know. Maybe some of you are honest enough to admit, yeah, I know I got that in my eye. Or maybe you just don't know. And I would encourage you to go and pray this week. God, help me to see it. Maybe your prayer needs to be something as simple as, Father, help me to see why that word is so important. God, help me to know what it means to love and that I am loved. And then perhaps the criticisms against the church when people call you out for being a bigot or judgmental or whatnot, they will nonetheless be able to see in you that humility. In no way am I suggesting we don't speak truth to this world, but I'm saying we need to have the right perspective that above all, we can declare like Paul, I am the worst of all sinners. Thank God he has shown his mercy to me. In Romans 2, Paul talks about that and saying that he has given us his patience so that we could have repentance. God didn't show you grace so you could just live in it and be so thankful that he's forgiving you, but to have repentance. That's why he's given you life still. That's why, unlike some of the people you know in your life, you're still here. So every week, we end with the times where we get to reflect on what Jesus went through for us. When we get to remember his body and his blood and if you've struggled with this log or, or whether you've not struggled with this log or whatever your relationship to this thing is, I want you to just imagine the incredible type of love that God has for you and how he's called us to bring that to this world, to set aside our blindness and to just live in his grace. Father, how often we have failed. And yet we know your mercies are new every day. God, we have a world that you know more than we do is so incredibly hostile to your son Jesus, is it hostile to the ways that you've called us to live holy lives. And God, we call on you to empower us to view ourselves in light of eternity. To recognize that even if right now in our lives we're doing well, we've, we've conquered a lot of sins because of your strength and goodness, we recognize that we had to conquer them in the first place with your help. God, keep us from pride and arrogance to live in love and humility. Strengthen your church to live such lives that declare, if nothing else, that you forgive all people who come to you. Strengthen us and be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.